Hello, welcome back to another episode of the Wild Heart Diaries. I am your host, Lisa Parks. I'm a coach, I'm an intuitive healer and spiritual detective. How's everyone doing today? How are you all doing? I hope you're well. As I'm recording this, it's the first bank holiday of our May marathon of bank holidays. We've got three bank holidays in the UK because it is our new king's coronation. Hmm. I don't know what you all feel about that. I am not a royalist, but I was a fan of Princess Diana. And I find the royal family fascinating. And I have written many blogs about that. If you'd like to hop on over to my blog, smileyforlife.com forward slash blog. <laughs> I have written about how the royal family play that dynamic out so perfectly for us all to see. It is fascinating and a really good case study. But um, I'm so glad you're here. And if you're family and you're back to listen to another episode, you're so very welcome. Thank you. And I've loved hearing all your feedback, actually. I've had really nice feedback from you all. And if you're new here, I just want you to know that you're welcome. I've had a few of you contact me actually and say that you've been binge listening. Um, You like to listen when you're doing the housework and when you're cooking the tea and some of you like to listen in the car and when you're walking the dog. So that's nice because as I'm recording, I can picture you all all over the world doing your thing. (laughs) And maybe some of you are turning up with your uh, pretty podcast notepads that I've made for you. You can get one of those if you go to my website smileyforlife.com and on the home page if you scroll right down to the bottom pop your details in and you can get a podcast notepad from there it's really good to write as you listen if you can it doesn't matter because if you're doing other things you're probably in quite a relaxed state so it's still going in but sometimes when we write stuff down um it helps us make sense of our jumbled thoughts and also it inspires us to take action we might want to take action so that's what that podcast notepad is for. But today I'm wanting to talk to you about self-love. I have 40 practical ways to help you love yourself more. Yay! Uh, Little things that I notice when I'm treating myself as less than or other little sneaky ways that come in where I'm not being very kind to myself. And um, yeah, hopefully those 40 ways will help you. It's impossible to love yourself until you've met yourself uh, truly, madly, deeply. And it's to be loved is to be seen and known. So I I have this is something I've written about self-love and I just want to share it with you. I've said getting to know yourself is the same as nurturing any other intimate relationship. You spend time creating memories together. You share what's on your mind. You listen and you're there for one another. And over time, your bond strengthens and you build trust and respect. You see, and that's why I love the journaling thing, because journaling is those conversations between you and you. And it's also a release. And that is an act of self-love that takes you away from the chaos of busy life. You get quiet time. And through those daily chats on the page, you notice how you're feeling. You listen to your inner voice. It might be a tiny whisper when you start and then you turn up the volume on that and it gets louder and you remember what matters to you and you 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 start to do that for yourself without feeling guilty, bad or selfish. And also when you journal, it silences that constant hum of negative thinking. So I find journaling helps me make peace with that. So if you can imagine what that might feel like for you if you've got a busy brain. And I think that's the place I'm always trying to get back to when life becomes stressful and overwhelming. And that's why my journal is part of my healing toolkit and a necessary part of taking care of my well-being. You know, just like I clean my teeth every day and have a wash and make sure I drink lots of water and eat my fruit and vegetables. That's something else I do to take care of myself. And I wrote that as an introduction to my new course, You Got the Love, which goes live on the 1st of June, by the way. You still got time to join me for 30 days of self-love journaling. It's it's definitely for you if you're loving and kind to everyone else, but not to yourself. And um, 
yes, I'll pop a link in the show notes for you. If you'd like to join us, you're very welcome. But I think when people talk about self-love, they think that a lot of us think, oh, I need to be perfect in order to be loved. So we slip into the realms of being unrealistic because perfection is not a thing. It's not achievable. In fact, perfectionism is self-harm. To expect such unrealistic standards from yourself is cruel and unkind. And sometimes it can be abusive. And maybe that comes from expectations that society has of you, or maybe from your family of origin, or maybe from a horrible shouty teacher at school, or maybe from an abusive partner. It comes from somewhere and we internalize it. And yeah, so self-love is really, we think we have to be a certain way in order to be lovable. But I just want to make the point that you're lovable just by being you. I think that's the point I want to make there. And all of these noises or opinions or judgments or thoughts that you're having about why you're not lovable is something to be explored and something which you can challenge and refute and think, where does that voice come from? Who's saying that to me? How did I learn that? How did I come to learn that about myself? So if you've got your journal right now and things are popping up in your mind or you've got your podcast notepad, write some of those things down that you have been told about yourself that make you unlovable the one I hate the most is parents is when a parent calls a child difficult that's actually French for I can't control you and that's making me feel really uncomfortable children are not difficult (laughs) and children and children get into power struggles with parents that are too controlling they're trying to take their power back so I think it's horrible to be called difficult to love. No one's difficult to love. It's just pretty not a very nice thing to hear, is it? And if someone can't love you, it is not on you. It doesn't mean you're unlovable. It means they don't have the capacity to love you. And they need you to be a certain way in order for them to feel comfortable. So they're regulating their feelings through you. Ick right? That's a really enmeshed codependent relationship with no energetic or emotional boundaries, right? So I just, I just want you to know, I mean, maybe that's a question to ask yourself in your journal. What does self-love mean to me? I have done lots of episodes on self-love on this podcast. So feel free to go back to series one and look at the old other episodes you will find them enlightening. It's always good to get a different perspective on things and write your definitions according to your values and what is important to you. What does self-love mean to me? Loving yourself is not about being perfect. Loving yourself is not about, um, you know, proving other people right or wrong. It's not about that. It's not about being what other people need you to be. It's about, um, acceptance it's about accepting yourself as you are warts and all and understanding how you came to be who you are and if there's stuff you see that you don't like or feels uncomfortable painful that you have the power to heal from that and change that right that's good to know isn't it we all have that power inside of us and actually while we're on the subject of power I just quickly go off on a tangent as I like to. I had a session with my therapist uh, this week and it was actually supervision because as we do as therapists, we come across things that trigger our own um, wounds. That's kind of how it works because you're in relationship with the client. So stuff is going to come up. So any good coach or therapist will have supervision and they will be doing the work on their stuff. Don't work with people that aren't because they'll be coming down from the mountains and preaching and they'll have read loads of stuff in textbooks about how you should behave. A should is a really shaming word. You want to work with people that are on the ground, keeping it real. (laughs) Uh, You know, ones that are open to changing the way they do things, ones that are open to apologizing and doing repair because we fuck it up sometimes. We get it wrong. Anyway, I was in a session with my therapist And we talked about how much power we have as therapists. 
And I don't mean that in a kind of ha ha ha, I've got all the power. But we have, we hold the power and we hold the client in a really vulnerable space and we take them to the edges of their unconscious and we sit in the darkness with them. And I don't think I'd appreciated how much power I had. And as I sat with that and unpacked it with my therapist, I realised that it made me feel quite uncomfortable. Um, so we were working on that and also recognising that the therapeutic process is something really sacred and oh, it's giving me goosebumps as I say that. Yeah, it's just such a sacred space to go into with someone. But equally, the other thing that I learn is, um, again, it's always back to boundaries with me because of my enmeshed relationship with my family of origin. That boundaries need to be put in place because I have power, but the wisdom and darkness of other people's trauma is all also powerful and it's and it's really hard to sit in and I noticed that so in my inner child healing circle which is the wild heart book club we have done our six weeks now we finished our six weeks a while ago and because we're a small group there's only three of us there's only three wild hearts and me so there's four of us in there at the moment we all agreed that it was working really well and they wanted to continue on working. So we we all we've they've all stayed in there and they've all paid me like a minimal fee to stay in there for another six weeks to get support. And was in there just talking to them about stuff and what's coming up, which is a massive part of healing is grief. There's so much grief in there. And specifically for the people in there, they are grieving losses of people, but they're also grieving childhoods that they never had that they should have had things that they didn't get growing up um things that they had to go through on their own so it's one thing being traumatized by i don't know the death of a parent or being abused or being a neglect emotionally neglected that's one thing but then having no one to tell about it and having to live with that and hold all of that inside you alone is another layer of trauma. It's like a double whammy of trauma. And I always say to them, that's why I know you're in here. And that's why I know you're strong, because that's what you've been through. You know, but what I'd underestimated was my levels of empathy and sensitivity. And my therapist described it as the difference between walking beside the client so you walk beside them, you don't sit opposite them, you walk beside, you're walking beside them and holding their hand as they walk along the healing path. The difference between walking beside and over identifying with the client. <clears throat> so that's where you need to put boundary in place. Um, and yeah, to, to protect yourself, because what happened was I was sitting on my sofa doing some updates to my website and I was watching uh, I was watching that blooming car- carpool karaoke with James Corden. I'm not a fan of James Corden. I'm not I'm not a massive fan of James Corden, but I am a huge fan of Adele. And they were in the car together and it was his last carpool karaoke. And it was it was obviously an ending and endings are about grief. And I was watching it and then I spent all afternoon crying on and off. And I thought you know, this isn't mine. I can feel the difference between when it's my grief because I have a lot of grief as well. And there's grief in in my family system, you know, um, that goes back through the generations that has not been looked at. I mean, I think we've all experienced grief on some point. And I think a lot of us hold on to that and don't have anywhere for it to go. They say that grief is love with with nowhere to go, don't they? But I recognised it wasn't mine. But anyway, I just cried. And then I went into the group and said, has anyone been crying? And it turned out that somebody had. And I said to my therapist, my God, I said, like, you think you're just popping into a Facebook group, answering people's questions. And yet 
it's still as powerful as if you've got the client sitting in front of you. She was like, yeah, because you can feel it. Like That's why you're good at your job, because you've got really, you're really sensitive and you've got really high levels of uh, empathy. She was like, but boundaries would be good there so that you can protect yourself. And I guess, I guess I'd underestimated um, that as well. And again, going back into the power of healing, when you create a group like that and you bring people in and they're safe enough to talk and you're going really deep into their stuff. And, you know, one of the reasons why we do it in Facebook like that is to put some boundaries in place. But still, I can feel pain, their pain, their sadness, their darkness through that no matter where they are in the world. Isn't that amazing? So I feel like this also might happen with the podcast. So if that's your experience of the podcast where you're having aha moments and insights or you're having shifts from listening and feeling like you're being seen and heard and understood, then let me know. Because I feel like the energy of me comes through in my voice into your earbuds. And I used to say this about my kids' podcast, the parents, and I I don't know, I think people might have thought I was mad at the time, but I do know it's a thing. It's happened to me. So I know that if it's happened to me, then surely it can happen the other way around. Anyway, let's get on to this. That's my uh, warm up. Let's get on to this list of 40 things, uh, 40 ways to love yourself more and see how we go. Yeah, it just blows my mind that does like just how how those connections can be formed without the person being in front of you. It's bloody amazing, isn't it? Right. Right. Yeah, still still on that. Right. Let's let go of that. So, um number 1, start the day 10 minutes early and practice just being, just being with yourself. Cuz I'm just saying that if the first thing you do when you wake up is you grab hold of your phone and you start scrolling or checking your emails or checking your messages or whatever you do, you wake up and t- and, and when you're coming to, like when you wake up in the morning, your brain is in this really nice state between not properly awake and not asleep. And that's a really good time to just be with yourself. That's a really good time to just sit with yourself and not reach for something to distract you from that. Remember, all of this self-love is about being with and staying connected to and being in relationship with yourself. Number two, give yourself permission to do nothing. How blooming hard is that? For those, for those of us that were parentified, that were emotional caretakers to parents, sitting down and doing nothing wasn't a thing. Also, if you lived in a house that was uh, abusive and chaotic, if you sit down and do nothing, you think you might get shouted at you're waiting for the other shoe to drop as we say so just being calm and 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 sitting with yourself and resting and when I say resting I mean lying down and I don't know (laughs) reading a book or just shut closing your eyes or you know I just picture myself now I'm lying on the sofa watching YouTube and I'm scrolling my phone and I've got my journal beside me and stuff's coming in and I'm making notes about podcast episode ideas and what I need to do tomorrow and all oh, I can help that client by showing them that and oh maybe I could speak to that client about that I'm not switched off from my life I'm still engaged with that stuff right so how easy is it for you to do nothing journal question and why is it hard And what happens for you when you sit there and do nothing? I would imagine that loads of uncomfortable feelings come rushing in. I don't know because I'm not you. Have a think about that. Number three, accept compliments graciously. This is about receiving and letting love in. Like, how does it feel? Journal question. How does it feel when someone recognises, compliments you, says thank you, praises you? I mean, our inner child is always looking for all of that validation and love. Our inner child is seeking that out. Well, one of our inner children is, or many of them, I expect. But then when we get it, because it might not have been safe to be in the spotlight when you were a kid, another part of us goes, oh, my God, this is so overwhelming. It's too much. I can't deal with it. 
Number four, make promises to yourself every day and keep them. Do you know, recently I've been waking up and thinking, oh, I'm just, I need to fall back in love with my book again. I need to sit down in my PJs with a pen and paper and go through all the chapters and get right back into the story again. No, avoiding doing that. Um, So I'm going to bed every night and thinking, right, I'm going to do that tomorrow. And then I'm not doing it. And avoidance of something is always self-protection. So when you're procrastinating, you're not being lazy. You're, you're protecting yourself from something. And yeah, so what are you protecting yourself from if you're breaking promises to yourself? Good question. Number five, use the time you spend scrolling the internet to do something you love. There is a thing called doom scrolling where I think we go seeking stuff that makes us feel shit about ourselves because our inner child is always looking for confirmation that what we believe about ourselves is true. Well, if you go looking for stuff like that, you're going to find it, aren't you? (laughs) It's everywhere. But actually, there if you do something you love, you step into a different energy. And again, it reconnects you back to yourself. You're not trying to see yourself or find yourself in other. You're actually sitting down and being with yourself. Number six, take time to get to know yourself. Journal. I think we've already talked about that a lot today. Be curious about yourself and take an interest in what you do, your choices, your likes, your dislikes, your wants and desires. I had a client say recently, when we, we so at Journaling Your Jammies this month, we talked about dreams, we talked about endings and beginnings, we talked about worries. It was actually a really good class. If you don't know about Journaling Your Jammies, it's a, a one hour workshop that I do on the last Wednesday of every month where you can come along and journal with me. If you want to meet me or you want to experience what it's like to be coached by me or you want to just sit in that lovely energy we're journaling by candlelight to twinkly music then please come along and join us I shall drop a link in the show notes but a client said to me I didn't even realize I had dreams or I had dreams when I was younger and I switched them off because I went and had kids and my life became about them and about work and so again get back in touch with yourself it's about getting back in touch with yourself number seven Notice the way you talk to yourself. Are you kind? Are you patient? Do you encourage yourself? Do you offer yourself compassion? Or are you critical? Do you doubt yourself, blame yourself and expect the worst? The way that we deal with our self-talk is by journaling, is by noticing the way that we speak to ourselves, bring it into our awareness and then change it. Number eight, stop tolerating toxic treatment and disrespect from other people. Stop making excuses for their behaviour. If they're grown ass adults, they know the difference between what is right and what is wrong. Where do you think you might be doing that in your life? Because by doing that, you're abandoning yourself. You're abandoning yourself and that is not self-love. Number nine, protect your energy. Your time is the most precious commodity that you have because you can't buy it back once you've spent it, right? Not everybody is entitled to a piece of you. Some people think they might be, but you get to decide who is allowed to be in your energy. Right. And sometimes you need to remind people and put some boundaries in place there. You're not here for other people. You're here to live your life. So think about where you're giving your energy. From a place of feeling obligated Or to avoid feeling guilty. Or because you're scared that the other person will be disappointed and angry with you. Where are you giving your energy from that space, from that energy? And where are you giving your energy from a place of love? Because you want to, because it feels good, because your cup's full. Giving from a full cup. Number 10, work out what is truly your responsibility in a relationship. 
<laughs> That's another thing my therapist often says to me, you're working above your pay grade. What she actually means is you're doing all the emotional lifting in this relationship with the client. Step back, i.e. stop being such a control freak and let the client sit in some of their stuff for a bit so that they can work it out for themselves that's that's love that's kindness isn't it that's love and that's kindness so what what are you responsible for and what's the other person responsible for and where are you doing things that people could do for themselves right if they could do it for themselves why are you doing it for them what what does that give you Number 11, declutter all the clothes that you've outgrown that don't suit you or don't fit you. Stop body shaming yourself. I'm not in the same body I was in 20 years ago. And I actually really love my body today for getting me this far. It's bloody amazing, seeing as it's riddled with trauma. It's bloody amazing that I'm nearly 50. Right? You know, saving, oh, I'm going to wear that dress when, or I will get back into those jeans, or no, 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 no. Chuck them out. Chuck them out. Chuck out all those grungy old pants. Well, maybe you need to save them pants, knickers. <laughs> In America, pants are trousers, aren't they? Are those grungy old undies? <laughs> maybe you do need them for a certain time of the month, but maybe you could have nice ones new ones you know we don't need to save new stuff for best we we deserve the best every day number 12 get really honest about how you spend your time notice there's a theme running here it's about how much you put yourself first (laughs) notice all the ways you prioritize other people first and um yeah why are you doing that why why am i doing that a lot of us a lot of us. I, I'll talk about it from my perspective because I don't know for you, but I would imagine a lot of us have our self-esteem based on, um, you know, our achievements, our accomplishments, what we do for others, because we were probably patted on the head as kids and we said, good girl, you've really been helping mummy because maybe mummy's love was conditional and she only loved you when you were a good girl, right? So then you learn to love through doing stuff for other people and your maybe your very existence is based on what you can do for others number 13 stop saying i don't know what would you say if you did know because when you stay in a state of confusion it's keeping you where you are but there is wisdom in that confusion. Like, why am I staying confused? Because if I stay confused, then what am I avoiding making a decision about? Do you see what I mean? Only you know what's right for you. So no one else can make the decision for you. Um, sometimes we don't want to make the decision because um, in other people's stories, we're going to be the villain or the bad guy. And that makes us feel ashamed or bad. But you know what? And this is something I'm learning to do. We are going to be the villain in someone else's story. But it doesn't mean that we're the villain. Like you get to decide who you are. And we're not always going to do things that other people want us to do. We are going to disappoint people and they are going to disappoint us. Number 14, learn to say no and mean it. (laughs) That's hard, isn't it? That's, That's boundary work. And as I say, like, Boundaries for me are always a work in pro progress. But when we say no, no is a full sentence. We don't have to justify, argue, defend or explain our decisions to anybody. Maybe in our closer relationships, we might um, we might want to explain to the other person to soften the delivery of no. And there are different types of no, aren't they? There is a no, not now. There's a no, not ever. <laughs> there's a I'll think about it and get back to you but then that's not really a straightforward no is it I think some people say that as a way of avoiding the no and then they never get back to the person and I think if you can hear the word no from someone else and you don't take it personally you don't make it mean that you're being rejected then it's easier to say it to other people that's what I've learned over the years none of us like hearing the word no 
because we have desires don't we we have wants we have needs but we and that's the risk i think of sometimes reaching out to the other person that they might say no to us but that doesn't mean that we're unlovable that doesn't mean that it's about us you know and also it's it's for the good of the relationship again you wouldn't want someone to say yes to you if they were doing something from a place of resentment and obligation and fear and guilt would you no i wouldn't because they're going to get really pissed off with me and that's all going to leak out in the relationship at a later date um 15 take full responsibility for what is not working in your life and make a commitment to change it it's not an opportunity to blame yourself or beat yourself up but um when you take full responsibility for your life it is empowering because you're like what can i do about this otherwise you become powerless to the other person and you stay in this space of helplessness and powerlessness and even though we can't change other people We can make a decision about how we bring ourselves to the relationship and the way we respond to other people and the way that we engage with other people and how much of our energy we give them. And all of those things are within our power and things that we can make decisions about. Number 16, forgive yourself when you fuck up. You will and you will do it often. Do it with grace and give others the same grace when they fuck up too. Because life is messy, isn't it? And we learn from our mistakes. And in human design, if you're aware of human design, I am a line, I'm a one three. And line three is all about learning and making mistakes and then putting them right. And I have a massive fear of making mistakes because, you know, uh, I had to be perfect as a child to be loved. And making mistakes induces huge amounts of shame in my body, which I am working through I'm always working through that. So, yeah. But forgiveness for yourself first, to know that you're human, to know that you aren't perfect, to know that you will make mistakes, to know that that's okay, and you're not expected to get it right all the time. I think to live in fear of making mistakes is is really hard because it's like having that really micromanaging controlling boss that sits in on your shoulder and watches everything you do and then what do you do when you have a boss like that you fuck up more you make more mistakes and it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy so if you're doing that to yourself just stop stop just say i'm gonna be kinder i'm gonna give myself more grace more leeway i'm gonna give myself permission to get it wrong when you're writing you learn that Like when you're writing a book, your first draft is crap. Give yourself permission to write a crap first draft because if you go all at it, trying to be perfect the first time you write it, you'll never write it. You'll never, ever do stuff that you expect yourself to do perfectly the first time because your fear of uh, getting it wrong will be right there sitting on your shoulder. Number 17, forget, when you're feeling down on yourself, put on a different head. <laughs> like You know, like words of gummage. So, you know, we've all had those moments, haven't we, where we're sort of spiralling to into Doomsville and going, oh, it, if we start catastrophizing or we start using it's never, it's always like that is the voice of doom. And also we've we're going into black and white thinking which is what the trauma brain does it's all or nothing it's right or wrong when you catch yourself doing that just say well I could choose to see it differently like just because you have a thought about something doesn't mean it's true just because you have a feeling feelings are not facts it doesn't mean it's true it's just a thought it's just a feeling you don't need to jump on it and make it your whole uh moment you can just say oh I'm going to choose a different one you know 18 work out your self-love language that was the last episode we did I think that's the whole episode on your self-love language and when you know that then it's easier to fill up your cup right so when I talk about filling up your cup when you do things for yourself you're connected to yourself there's more love inside of you there's more love there's more compassion there's more self-acceptance there's more kindness and then that means that you can give that out to the world Number 19, remember to play, laugh and have fun. 
<laughs> dance around your house and smile often. It's quite hard to be moody if you just smile, isn't it? Like if I properly go into a smile now, I can't be moody. Um, don't, don't fake it though. Like if you're feeling pissed off, don't smile. But sometimes when I'm in a really deep mood and I want to snap out of it, like I can see that I'm hurting myself by staying in that space. If I look in the mirror and smile at myself, I can shift my mood. And, and music changes your energy, changes your vibration. It shifts stuff as well. When you move your body, when you're dancing, you're shifting negativity, you're shifting energy out of your body. 20. Daydream. And then notice what it is that your soul wants to create. So I don't know if you were that kid that used to daydream a lot in class. I did. I was always floating off, making up little stories in my head, thinking about the next holiday we would go on. Um, you know, just just let your mind wander to other places. A brain is so clever. It has that capacity. And um, again, that's what we did at Journaling Your Jammies this month. So April's Journaling Your Jammies was about using your imagination to create powerful scenarios and, you know, if you if you think it, if you think it, you can think it into existence. It, it, it can happen for you if you think it. And it's really hard because our brain is programmed for danger and safety. It takes practice, a conscious effort to, to find the good, to see the good. And so journaling and daydreaming is a really powerful way to do that. 21. Take yourself out on a date. Do you ever just go out and do stuff on your own? Do you ever just take yourself off somewhere for the weekend or go out to the cinema and watch a film by yourself or go off to the library and read a couple of chapters of your book or go out for a walk by yourself? Not not because you're walking the dog, just because you want a bit of time to yourself. Do you ever do that? Do you ever plan something and think, oh, I'm going to just do that for me? Self-love date. Put them in your diary. 22. Halfway there, 22, put yourself first for a change without guilt or regret. So I have talked about that. But um, those feelings of guilt that come up are, are conditioning. Yeah. Because as women, we're programmed to put everyone else first and take care of people, right? So um, put yourself first. Think of that. Think of the oxygen mask on the airplane. If you don't love yourself first you've got no love inside of you to give away to other people 23 practice asking people for space when you need it yeah that's hard isn't it if you worry about turning other people away it may be because it's hard for you to hear that as well we all need time and space to ourselves and it's not a crime and it's quite interesting when we don't make ourselves available to people, how they respond to that. Do they respect that? Are they respectful of our needs or is it all about them? These are all good journal questions to think about. Lots of to think about today. Um, 24. Slow down. Don't treat everything like it's urgent or needs to be done now. It doesn't. And when we are triggered and our trauma mind takes over, or our fear takes over, it feels like the sky is falling on our head and everything is urgent and must be done yesterday. And that is a sign that you're triggered, actually. So when you go into that space, it's like nobody's dying. Everyone's safe. It's fine. Practice pressing the pause button. I'm just going to take a moment. So when people ask you something and you feel obliged to reply really quickly, press the pause button and say, thanks for asking me. Can I get back to you on that? Press pause. 25. Trust yourself to make the right decision. Because there's no such thing as a wrong decision. Only one that feels right in the moment. So we make decisions. If we make decisions with your head, <laughs> you go into that space of is it right or wrong? But if you go inside your body and listen to your gut feeling about something, that's the right decision for you. It feels good. If it doesn't feel good, nah, it's not for you. But when you go up into your head, you'll start thinking, oh, and what will the other person think? And what will they, and what, but, but, 
And then when you're up in your head, you've lost that connection with your body. Uh, 26, start a worry box. Hmm, I used to do this with the kids. So every time you have a worry, you write it down, you give it to the box to take care of it for you. You can do that digitally by opening a notes page on your phone. But you don't want to be carrying that shit around you with you all the time. And you know what? When you put stuff in the worry box and it gets held somewhere else, it passes and it stops becoming a worry. When we go up into our heads to worry, when we have like chronic anxiety, we're, we're disconnecting from our bodies. Probably because we've got a lot of feelings that are too painful and they're all coming in at once. So if we go up into our bodies and start to ruminate on them. Yeah. So put them in a worry box and just know that most of the things that we worry about do not happen anyway. They don't happen. We're trying to forecast the future. We're trying to control the uncontrollable. It gives us a semblance of control, but actually we're not in control of anything. Take your hands off the steering wheel. 27, face your fears. This is a hard one. What's the very thing that you don't want to do? The very thing that you don't want to do is probably the thing that you need to do. Look at fear in the face and tell it you're not afraid of it. Do you know what I think? I think we're not afraid of doing the thing. We're afraid of all the feelings that will come up as doing a result as a result of doing the thing. Right? Because we're going into the unknown. 28. Don't overschedule yourself. Scheduling downtime so you can ta- you can have time to decompress from the stressful busy world yeah how many of us over schedule ourselves as a way of avoiding being with ourselves and some of us find it hard to be by ourselves I used to I love my own company now but I used to hate being by myself hate it I didn't know myself it was scary to be by myself when you have when you come from an enmeshed family where everyone's operating in a group thing and you all function together to step out of that and be by yourself, it's like losing limbs. You're like, I don't know. I don't know who to be if I'm not with them. I don't know what I look like if I'm not with them. And it can be scary. So who, who am I if I don't see myself through the lens of my parents or the lens of my family? Well, that's 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 what it's all about, isn't it? It's discovering who you are. Uh, 29, allow yourself to receive. Well, we've talked about accepting compliments, but also this is about allowing yourself to receive help, allowing someone to make you a cup of tea, delegating stuff to other people and getting them to do it for you. When we ask for help, there is a risk that people will say no. But if we give them permission to say no to us, then we have permission to say no to them when they ask us. We don't have to always say yes it doesn't always have to be us if we say no they can go off and find someone else to help them there's loads of people that will help them they have to get resourceful so do we if someone says no to you when you ask for help go and find someone else that can help you asking for help is a vulnerable thing if you were a kid who who had to deal with everything by yourself I'm raising my hand to that one, then you will be used to, it's a pattern of behaving. But as a kid, that served you well. That's how you got through it. But as an adult, as an adult, it's now becoming a problem because you're not connecting and reaching out to other people. You know, there's lots of help around. If And just because you need help doesn't mean you're inadequate, wrong, bad, needy. It doesn't mean any of those things. It just means that sometimes there's shit that we can't do on our own. And it makes it so much easier if you've got a friend to help you with that, doesn't it? Yeah. 30. Notice where you're holding on to feelings. So where does it feel tense or hurt in your body? We do hold on to feelings. Maybe because we don't know how to process them. Maybe in a conflict situation, we hold on to anger and hurt and despair and grief because if we let go of those feelings, we have to let go of the person and that's all we've got left of them. That's what's popping into my head with that one. 31. Instead of making things right or wrong, experiment. Yeah. 
oh, I don't know if that's the right thing to do. I don't know if I should do that. Should, obligation, fear and guilt, no thanks. Experiment, just say, I'm going to have a go at this. Who cares if it's right or wrong? I'm just going to do it and see how it makes me feel. Just try, throw caution to the wind. (laughs) Live life on the edge. Um, 32, stop invalidating yourself. If you feel something, it's real and true in the moment for you. Don't judge yourself by minimising your feelings or deny them. And that comes from how the adults that raised us treated our feelings. So I don't know. I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, this thing happened. And yeah, I was scared. And yeah, it made me sad. But, you know, it wasn't as bad as Sally next door because she lost her baby. And like, I've got no right to feel about this because God, can you imagine what it would be like to lose a baby? Like, don't play the trauma comparison game like it your feelings are all relevant to what's happening to you in the moment and yes someone will always have it worse than you some people will have it better than you that's life but doing that minimizes your feelings and I think that makes us push them away and then they get trapped and stored inside of us right don't invalidate yourself you've probably had enough people doing that like forever in a day You don't need to be another person um, who does that. 33, stop betraying yourself. Who are you hanging around with that you're loyal to and respectful to? And they are not fully showing up for you. Maybe you're an afterthought. Maybe they don't respect your wishes, don't respect your boundaries. Every time we do that, we're abandoning ourselves. We're betraying ourselves. 34. Stop over explaining yourself. So when you get into conversations with people where you have to do something which is called JADE. JADE stands for justify, argue, defend or explain. When people get you on the defensive, they, you know, (laughs) they want an argument with you and they want to be right. So what? Do you want to be right? Do you want to be kind? Let them. Let them. I think that's one thing I'm understanding, that people are going to have opinions and make judgments about you in their head. That's the story. They're Like sometimes people need to make you wrong so they don't need to look at their shit. Right. So I just go, OK, make me wrong then. And then we lose the relationship. And then what? Is that what you want? I don't know. I just don't think it's helpful. It's not helpful, is it? Thirty five. Take some photographs of yourself on a day when you feel good. Yeah. The work equivalent for that is uh, look at all the testimonials that clients have sent you. And when you feel like you're not getting somewhere or, you know, us therapists do go into a space of not good enough while we take that to supervision. You know, clients get stuck in their healing and it's not our job to unstick them, but it's our job to sit with them in the stuckness and maybe try and help them work out what the stuckness is because all of that stuff has wisdom in it you know we're not trying to get rid of stuff and eradicate it we're trying to get curious about it and understand what it means but uh, reminding yourself that you will have moments where you don't feel good about the way you look or you don't feel like you're doing enough or you feel like you could be doing more but um, I wonder where that voice comes from where does that voice come from it's not a loving voice It's a demanding voice that's got expectations of you to look or be a certain way in order to be loved and accepted. 36. Acknowledge your efforts and your achievements. Because building building up a bank of those things that you do builds confidence, but it also dissolves shame because it builds trust with yourself it says oh yeah look I do all these good things I can do good things so on those days where you're going oh, I did that wrong and oh, I haven't done that yet and da, 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 and you're making yourself wrong and beating yourself up you forget about how far you've come on your healing journey and all the things that you've done right yeah you know we're not one thing or the other we're not all good or all bad that is a that is a myth. There are no good or bad people. There are no good or bad children. That's where it comes from. Like you're naughty if you do this and you're good if you do that and you get rewarded. 
It's not it's true. It's split that splitting people into all or nothing black and white thinking. Nobody is all good and nobody is all bad. Even people like Hitler. Hitler even thought that what he was doing was for the good of something. You know, evil people don't wake up in the morning, look in the mirror and think, ha ha ha, how can I cause, you know, there's good and bad in everyone and there's shades of grey. Humans are way more complex than that. So remind yourself that when you're putting yourself in a space of being all bad or all good, right, it's not true. None of that is true. None of it is. It's rubbish. It's absolute bullshit. <laughs> um, 37. Listen to your body. Eat when you're hungry, pee when you need to, sleep when you're tired and pay attention to your body's warning signs when things are getting too much. So always, I think, when our body's trying to tell us something, um, you know, maybe we're not listening to it because we're not in tune with, we're not connected to our bodies, but also maybe we're taught to deny having needs. So how many of you are hungry and then don't eat and think, oh, I'll eat in a minute because I need to get this thing done first. Right, that's not very loving, is it? Because if a baby was crying out to be fed, are you going to leave it in the cot crying for hours? No, I would hope not. I would hope you would go and pick it up and feed it. But it's how you were treated and then you pick up from there and you start treating yourself in the same way until you learn to treat yourself. Until you learn to treat yourself differently. or oh, hit the mic there. Um... 38. Take time to stop and notice what is good in your life. And I've already sort of talked about that. But what I mean by that is people might say, do it, do it, gratitude practice. And um, actually in journaling your jammies this month, a lady that came along reframed gratitude for me, which I was really grateful for, ironically. And she said, what about the word appreciation? I hate the word gratitude because I was always told how ungrateful I was and I didn't pre- I didn't um you know like I was an ungrateful child which basically was french for I don't feel appreciated by the other person but you know there's some people that no matter how much you appreciate them it's just not enough you know so I think If you can just start saying, hey, this is what I like about my life or this is what I love about my life. Like right at the top of the page of your journal, I like, I like big butts and I cannot lie. I don't know why that song's just got into my head. I like dot, dot, dot. I like tulips because I'm just sat here looking at a vase full of really gorgeous purple tulips. I like uh, tarot cards because I've got loads of those. I like crystals. I like cups of tea. Let's have a serve of my tea. I like candles. Always got a candle on the go. You'll see me as we're revving up for the journaling your jammies at the end of the month. I will usually post a picture on social media because I've bought a new a candle for us to light. <laughs> um, just write a list of things that you like and notice how good that feels. Takes your brain off to a different space instead of looking at all the things that you don't like. You know, that being said, with all these sort of tricks and things, sometimes you need to sit in that space of being in a grump. I did that yesterday. I was in a really bad mood yesterday off the back of my therapy session on Friday. And then I know that once I've cried and the tears come, that I'm dissolving normally shame and old um, old traumas. And once I've had a good old cry, I cook myself some dinner And then I know that when I woke up this this morning or the next day, I'm going to be all right again. That's my that's how I process stuff. Um, Yeah. Thirty nine. Let yourself be excited and enjoy the moment. Expect the best. You deserve the best. That might be two in one there, Lisa. So this might be 41 instead of 40. Let yourself be excited. How hard is it to trust that this good stuff is is good? How many of you are waiting for the other shoe to drop? How many of you think this is too good to be true? I mean, sometimes when people are are too good to be true, it's normally the case, you know. Relationships are not a Hallmark movie or a Disney film. 
or a rom-com. But, um, you know, let yourself be excited and enjoy the moment. You know, if you were raised by someone whose mood dictated the family, it meant that when they were mad, you had to be like you couldn't be happy or when they were anxious, you couldn't be happy or when they were feeling shit, which was probably most of the time because they couldn't regulate their own feelings. You weren't allowed to be joyful and happy. Right. But if they were joyful and happy, you had to be joyful and happy, even when you might have been feeling sad and anxious. So your mood was dictated by their mood. Oh, God, that's so head fucky, isn't it? Right. So it's going to take some practice to just feel your own feelings and not feel your feelings based on how other people are feeling. Separate yourself out from them. Put some boundaries in place. It's not insensitive. Like you could hold space for someone that's feeling sad and anxious. It doesn't mean your whole mood then has to be sad and anxious for the rest of the day. You can be concerned for, you can sit with, you can have empathy for that person, but you don't need to absorb their feelings. I'm saying that for myself because I do that and I'm learning not to. And that's really freeing. So bloody freeing. And you it doesn't mean you don't care and you're insensitive if you don't. Which is what I was taught. You don't care about me because you're out skipping and playing in the garden while I'm sitting in here making chucking things around the kitchen and hoovering really loudly and deep breathing and muttering under my breath how no one cares about me. Sorry, oh, that's that's me telling a story about my childhood there. I just noticed how random that sounded. But like, ask for help then. Ask for help. Um, Number 40. We've reached the end of our list and we're coming up to an hour. That's really good. Number 40. Get outside and reconnect with nature. Feel the sun on your face and the wind in your hair. How good does that feel? You are nature. You came from nature. And when you get back outside in nature, you reconnect with that part of yourself. And again, it's all about, as you've noticed, it's all about reconnecting with yourself. That is what self-love is. Being with yourself, having a relationship with yourself, being curious, being interested in yourself, understanding yourself. That is what self-love is. So I hope you found today's episode useful. If you'd like to join me for You Got the Love, which is 30 days of journaling, <clears throat> it's journaling with me and asking more reflective questions like this and coming into a group and being with other people who are doing the same thing. We'll all take on that lovely energy that I've talked about today and it will be powerful and magical. You are very, very welcome. I will put a link to You Got The Love in the show notes and I hope to meet more of you and see more of you there and you can come into that space and, and we can all be together and yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to be really good. Um, I think that's it for today because we're coming up to the hour and it's been quite a there's a lot of information in today's episode and I think you could probably listen to it more than once and do lots of journaling on all of those points and questions and even do a little bit of a recce with yourself and think, I, I, do I love myself? Am I good at loving myself? Where do I need more practice? How could I love myself more? For me, it's about letting more love in. It's about letting more love in. What I tend to do is over, over love and over give to other people to the detriment of myself which I'm sure you can all relate to right so until next time lovely world hearts stay wild choose love so much love to you bye for now <laughs>